here again. I appreciate you coming. Um, my part in this is to just intro us, and then we're going to do a little bit of tag teaming for this presentation on social emotional learning in the Native Middle School. So my name is Rosemary Vickery, principal at Kennedy. This is Suzanne Kenny, who is the vice principal at Wilson. Nicole Barbosa, who is a guidance counselor at Wilson. Oh. Just say. Okay. <laughs> See, no, I'm, okay, that's, take care of it for me. Um, Nicole Picasso, who is guidance counselor at Wilson, and Jamie Nonfer, who is um, a psychologist and a social worker. Like social, help me. Psychologist. I, that's what I thought, okay. I don't want to mess anybody else up. And we have one of our peer leaders as well from Wilson, Bela, Bela Ghosh, who's a peer leader here at Wilson, and you'll meet some Kennedy peer leaders via the video. On our electronics. <laughs> right, right. So, um, thank you for being here, and I do want to just say that, um, this is a big component of our program, too, that we really probably don't broadcast enough to parents, but we want to assure you that we do take care of the social-emotional learning piece for your students as they go through the middle level. And again, at the high school, too, it, it's named something else. But as Anna had said earlier, Open Circle is probably a name that you're familiar with from the elementary level. I've been trained as an elementary school teacher in Open Circle. And this is um, what we do at the middle level is also research-based, and it's kind of a combination of a couple of different things. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So the objectives for today, um, here's the intro. I could have read it off the screen and not messed up, but anyway, <laughs> let's keep going. Um, our objectives for today, obviously you can read these, but we want you to get to know each other a little bit better. I think it's really important for parents to have a parent community to, you know, to talk about. When I was raising my kids and I was like, I'm saying no, you say no, it was helpful. You know, I'm saying yes, will you drive, that kind of thing. Um, we also want to explain, as I said, what social-emotional learning is for you. I mean, you hear about social media, that's not what this is. This is about helping your child cope with and get the skills that they need to manage their lives from this point forward. Um, make the connection for you between social-emotional learning and academics. And you, you're not ready for learning if you're so tied up emotionally. So it's incumbent upon us to address those issues for children in schools as well. Because learning doesn't happen if we don't take care of the social emotional component for kids. So um, we also want to be able to identify ways in which we address this at the middle school, and I talked a little bit about that. I'm going to turn this over to Nicole. And we're going to tag team. Do you want me to do this for um, you? Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, I'm going to start off by just giving you guys a little bit of an overview about what social emotional learning is and why it's important that we teach these types of skills to our students in school. Um, so social emotional learning is um, the process through which children and adults um, develop skills to effectively handle themselves and their own emotions, um, their relationships with others, and how we do our work together, um, both in school and just working together socially. Um, these are skills that help children to calm themselves down when their emotions are really high, if they're angry, if they're stressed, um, if they're upset. How do they handle their emotions? Um, we teach them skills to help develop and maintain their friendships. And we also talk to them about how to make good, ethical, constructive choices in their lives. There are lots of aspects to social emotional learning, and this graphic up here nicely summarizes social emotional learning into three different categories. Um, the areas up here in red have to do with self awareness. And students become able to recognize their own emotions and their own strengths and limitations, and then with that, they can better manage their emotions and. Um, work to reach their goals, both academically and socially. The part in blue up here um, relates to, Dan to um, managing their relationships with others. Um, so students are taught to show empathy for others and enhance their relationship skills so that they're better able to form positive relationships, work well with others, and effectively resolve conflicts. The green portion here is for responsible decision making. And um, part of social emotional learning involves helping students to make good constructive choices. This kind of just highlights how everything sort of works together with social emotional learning. So why is social emotional learning important in schools? Um, there's been a lot of research in this area in the past 20 years even more research in about the past 10 years as people have looked into this field and figured out what is effective to help create healthy individuals in schools. Um, 
And when students receive direct instruction related to social emotional learning, there are positive short and long term academic and personal outcomes. Um, so students are able to become more academically successful. They learn skills that help them socially. And all of these translate into their adult lives as well. Um, it's also important that we teach them these skills in schools because your children are here with us in school for most of their day. So we have a lot of opportunities um, to teach these, them these skills and also they're practicing these skills every day in their classrooms and also socially with their peers. Um, social emotional learning is also important because the research shows that when kids are taught these skills, it prevents some of the high risk behaviors um, that we don't want to see as well. So with regards to promoting academic success, um, academic attitudes that we want to see increase, such as greater motivation, commitment to their learning, and um, attachment to school increases as well. And so when kids feel that type of commitment and attachment to school, they want to do well, um, they want to work with others. This increases the behaviors that we want to see in school, it increases their ability to work better together with others, um, develop good study habits, and their attendance increases as well, kind of goes along with their commitment to school and to the school community. And um, research also shows that um, their academic performance increases. So their grades improve, standardized test scores go up, and um, general subject mastery is greater when kids also learn social emotional skills when they're in school. Social emotional learning promotes life skills in that it creates kids that are more able to persevere through difficult times, they're more resilient, um, students are more caring, compassionate citizens in their community, develops a lot of skills around teamwork, which is certainly essential um, at this age level and in adulthood, and also we teach them a lot of skills to resist negative influences. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we um, actually instruct kids in this way in the native public schools. So we started thinking about how can we incorporate um, the best of the best. Native does a really nice job through our psychologists, our guidance counselors, and our student services department to research the best that's out there nationally, and we did that a few years ago. So we really have a conglomeration in, at the native public schools at the middle level of what the best research-based programs are. One of them happens to be called Second Step. It's out of the Washington State, and it's really middle level. Open, skill, uh, open Circle was an elementary program, if you will, and we needed something that addressed the needs of the middle level student when, and what they were faced with when they came to middle school, be it fifth grade or sixth grade or whatever. So we really looked at it and second step, as I said, is research based. It's found to increase social um, competency and positive attitudes and then decrease the aggression, the, the aggression and the anxiety and the depression. So when I spoke earlier about all those different physiological changes going on with the student and now we've got academic pressures for them, these lessons will help kids manage what that means. Like, I'm feeling really crazy right now, and what I want to do is get up and do something crazy. And our guidance department will sit there, and here's how to cope with that. And I think we could all learn from it, quite honestly. You want to take a deep breath. You want to talk about what you're feeling right now. You want to talk about ways that you can manage those feelings. And that's what this is all about. And then by grade level, and I'll talk about it in a second, we really deline delineate, if you will, developmentally appropriate skills necessary for that grade level, if you will, and it kind of builds one on top of the other. So you can read these slides, I, I don't want to read them for you, but we do a mixture of, it's not a classroom like this where the sage on the stage comes up and they tell you everything you know and they walk out. It really is interactive in a classroom where we'll do, the te I won't do, but the teachers and the guidance departments will do a very nice job with um, giving kids a scenario, what would you do, how do you feel, role playing, that kind of thing. So the kids get to see what are real life scenarios in middle school and how they can work those through with this instruction and these lessons. And then we expect our students to practice those in real life. So we refer back to them about it. I, I think if you're from elementary, you, you heard about the double Ds, destructive and help me, I lost the name of that, but anyway. Thank you. <laughs> I knew it as a teacher a number of years ago. So there's that common lingo, if you will, across the middle schools as well, about what it means to use these skills in everyday practice. 
So by grade level, we talk at grade five, and this is when they first come to us, and they're meeting new friends from the other feeder elementary schools. You know, what does respect mean, and what do we mean by respect in the middle school? And respect for yourself, respect for others, respect for property, that kind of thing. Um, and we spend two lessons on that, and then empathy. So kids will say, well, yeah, that means that you feel sorry for someone. And we say, no, we really define what being empathetic means for kids. And how can you practice empathy in school? So, you know, you see somebody sitting at a table by themselves, you could do something to help them out at the lunch table. And how can you, you know, take that leap of faith yourself, that kind of thing. That's hard for kids to do, but that's embedded in our program of instruction here and other um, scenarios like that. And at every grade level, we discuss bullying. And, um, you know, who, what, where, when, how, what you can do to combat it, how you can help it, and then problem-solving skills. And also um, problem-solving skills in the way that you go through a potential number of steps that you think what might work, and you go and try them out. And they're either going to do one of two things. It's going to work for you, or it's not. And either way, you're going to learn. So if it doesn't learn, what could you do and come back again and talk about that? So it really is a cyclical, cyclical program of instruction to help kids manage their lives when at the middle level especially, it's all about social. You know, you want it to be all about math and science, and so do I, <laughs> and English, because I was an English teacher, but it's really about what do my peers think of me, and how am I going to get through this, and yesterday she was my best friend, and now she won't even sit next to me. These are things that they face, and they don't know how to deal with, so this program helps us help them deal with those feelings. Grade six, again, working in groups, friends and allies, considering perspectives, which is a good thing for sixth graders to do, but it's just, again, developmentally appropriate. When their brains are ready to take these things on, this is where we're introducing them, if you will. Um, recognizing bullying, etc. Bystanders versus upstanders, and stress management. And um, kids' lives are really stressed. I don't have to tell you, you're living with them 24-7. They've got a lot on them. You know, I want to be the best soccer player, I want to get all A's, and I want to be everybody's best friend. And we know as adults that that probably is not going to be what happens for that child. And what happens, what do you do when one of those components falls apart for a kid? How do you help them cope? So that's what this is about, too. Um, we go on to seventh grade and talk about it. We talk again about bullying empowering students to be upstanders. And that's the language that we use, okay? Upstanders versus bystanders, that kind of language which is embedded in all of our classes. Communication skills. How do you communicate? appropriately. Yeah, somebody might be making you really angry, but the last thing you can do is bop them one. I mean, that's not appropriate <laughs> communication. So what can you do? And we use a lot of I statements. I'm not really happy about what's going on. I feel those kind of things. We coach the kids through those things. And we share this with you so you know what we're saying in classes at each grade level. So you can also use this at home, because when you're in the thick of emotions, it's really hard to come up with, oh, what should I be saying here? What should I be doing? I'm sorry, Mr. Trevor. I, I just know. wanted to know what the definition of an upstander is, so we know the terminology. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Sorry. No, that's fine. An upstander is um, mm -hmm. a person who does something about the bullying that they see or know about that's happening. So we teach them that Correct. bystanders know that something's going on, and they choose not to do anything about it. So we teach kids what they can do. And it's not always, you know, I see someone bullying someone and I'm going to jump into the situation. We give them a lot of different strategies and tell them, choose the one that feels safest and most comfortable for you, but that every child can do something to prevent bullying from happening. So they'll, I mean, the fifth graders, they'll recognize that term? Yes. Yep. We also use allies, too, mm -hmm. interchangeably with upstander. So we teach them that an ally and an upstander is the same thing, but a bystander is something that we don't necessarily want kids to be, but that that's why sometimes bullying happens and everybody knows about it. The kids do, but often we don't, which is another message that we send them. A lot of stuff happens when adults aren't there. So what can you as kids do to you know, improve different situations that are happening? And I think, too, what one of the things we try to teach them is the power of the upstander or the ally because it's really only a very small percentage of kids who would engage in bullying behavior. Um, but it's a very large number of students who witness that. And so we explain to them that the power that they hold is incredible because as Nicole said, typically kids don't do mean things in front of adults. They do it when no one's looking. So um, a lot of times what happens in a situation is that one kid does something that's mean to another kid. Six kids see it, they all feel icky about it, but nobody does anything. And so we talk to them about the message that you send when you do nothing is that you're okay with it. 
So what are the different ways in which you can help stand up, which is upstand, or stand up for that person who has been targeted for whatever reason? And it could be in that moment you stand up for them, or it could be later on when you just go up to them later and put your arm around them and say, hey, that was really lousy. He shouldn't have said that. That was mean. I'm sorry that happened to you. So there's all different strategies that we teach the kids. Um, and actually later when Bela's going to do a little uh, group activity with you, and you'll see sort of one of the many ways that the, the um, older students in the school try to help um, the younger students understand ways in which they can be positive, um, help create a more positive culture in school. I know you can't like educate us on um, everything that's in there, but I know they're like parent uh, teaching on Open Circle for the elementary. Mm -hmm. Do you have a parent teaching class, if you will, for second step curriculum? We haven't at the moment, to be perfectly honest with you. No, we were using this as kind of the broad overview to give you an understanding, but we can certainly work with um, developing something like that, number one, or also working with our guidance counselors. The guidance counselors are really the ones who go into the classrooms and teach this kind of thing, so if you wanted to know more about that for your particular child's grade level, you could also contact the guidance counselor. I just lessons. think it would be a value, like the terminology yeah. and stuff. Well taken. When I went to the open circle, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, this is what all this is about. Okay. I mean, you get, uh, yeah, I had no clue yeah. for a year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, today is really our first step at doing that kind of thing. So, so I, would I don't think this will be one request to have. <laughs> and actually, you know what? I would ask if anyone likes that idea, would you please put that on the feedback sheet for the end of the day? I can do a um, Because then we can look at whether do we do something um, where we do another uh, get together like this, or do we create a webcast that people can view at home? I mean, there's lots of different options that we can do. But if you feel like you would like a broader understanding of the different curriculum at the different grade levels, um, let us know that. When is this taught to the kids? Is it taught when something bad happens, or is this, I don't understand when yeah, yeah, it happens. happens. Great. I mean, each school probably does it a little bit differently, but there's time built into the schedule at each grade level for um, guidance counselors to go in and even administrators to um, teach these different lessons. So here, and also in Kennedy, in fifth grade, they have core values class. And so there's a series of lessons that are just part of the, it's one of their specials, one of their electives. In sixth um, grade at Kennedy, it's part of, it comes out of their cultural world language time, if you will. So they have same French, they have Spanish, and then they have this. Yeah. In seventh grade, teachers go into classrooms during social studies at least at Kennedy, and we look for those connections with the social studies curriculum, like the Holocaust, what would have happened if there had been an upstander. So we look for those, and we do a lot with facing history in ourselves. I don't want to overlook that. We've had a lot of teachers trained through that program, which is Boston-based, and it helps us look at what happens in history and what would have been different if people had reacted differently. So wow, those cool. connections we, need, we need this. That's okay. Okay. okay, that's great feedback. That's good, so let us know that if you would. Because um, we'll it just makes it, I think, reinforced the development. Right. Right. Sure. Yeah. sure. Because we didn't even know this was happening. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, and I think that's sort of what we're, we're starting to try to do now is to make sure that the parent community is aware that we're doing this. And I think the beauty of it becomes then that we can reinforce the values you're teaching at home and you can reinforce, like, if you have the common language that we have, it just makes it easier to have those conversations with your kids if you know the language that we're using at school. You know, we were just talking about um, there are some spouses or significant others, other parents that are have a different way of, oh, well, you're dealing with this? You know, go right back. And so it would be great to be able to educate them yes. about, okay, this is, you know what, that was great when we were, but this is how we need to implement it in this school system mm -hmm. so everything is the same page. Because mm -hmm. right. if we, you know, we can do so much for you as educators to instill, you know, instill them. Yeah. I mean, and I think, too, what we respect is that each family has its own way of, um, teaching their children what they expect in terms of respect and values from them. Um, and as a school community, we have a certain standard of what we expect of one another in terms of respect and empathy and how we treat one another. So um, having this back and forth communication would be really helpful so that we can reinforce one another. Because basically we all just want people to be nice to one another. We want people to go through their days without worrying that someone's going to be mean. And, I, and just in this in the spirit of you know historical perspective, we did a lot of this. I've, I've been in Natick seven years. We did a lot of it everywhere all along, but it was not as well defined as it has been in the last couple of years. And I think that might impact why you may or may not have known about it. There was a difference between what was happening at Wilson and when, and what was happening in Kennedy. Were we teaching the same things? Yes, we absolutely were. But, but with the advent of you know the anti-bullying legislation that came through, we had to really define what we were doing, which was good for all of us as educators to do across the nation, quite honestly. And then our peer leadership program made us really look at what do we want to teach kids at every grade level and how do we want to, and use research based, you know, we don't want to pull things out of thin air and then say, oh, that didn't work, we're going to try something else. So we were very thoughtful 
about how what, what how would we construct this program and what is developmentally appropriate for a fifth grader as opposed to an eighth grader. I'll, trust me, we expect a lot more of our seventh and eighth graders than we do of our fifth and sixth graders right now. But the language is, is common, you know. We're talking at, at eighth grade, just to come back to this, but, you know, leadership and what does it mean to be a leader? And then, you know, the things that Suzanne and Nicole said, I also want you to say, when we teach kids to be upstanders, we don't put the pressure on them to be an upstander, because it's really important that you're an upstander, but you're safe. So you can be an upstander in a lot of different ways and not expose yourself. You've got to know what your comfort level is. And we have to say to kids, it's okay if you don't want to stand there when some bully is taking on somebody and you stand up, you might be taken on too. That's very difficult for a child. But here's a way to manage, and Suzanne gave a perfect example of that. So those are the scenarios that we talk about with kids. And again, when we get to eighth grade, we talk about as I said, leadership and empowering kids to be upstanders, but also, you know, diversity and accepting diversity. Accepting diverse, this is a very diverse community. Um, you know, and you wouldn't think it if you looked at Natick on the whole. You know, I got here seven years ago and I thought, okay, this is real, well, it's the kind of town I grew up in, New York City. It's just very similar, you know, and uh, people walked into Kenny, I said, oh, I went here. I said, yep, that's what everybody said in my grammar school or high school, too. But it's a very diverse and it's getting more diverse. So how do you accept that diversity? Diversity amongst families, diversity amongst ethnic, um, you know, socioeconomic. There's a lot of diversity in this town. And how do you accept it and how do you respect it? So those things are embedded, again, appropriately at eighth grade because kids are starting to look at the world in that way. In fifth grade, they're, you know, not, not there yet. Um, and obviously, of course, we're talking about cyberbullying in eighth grade because uh, and seventh grade, and in fifth and sixth as well, but m more to the extent of, you know, now it's in your world and, and how, you, how are you going to keep yourself safe. So this kind of is the broad overview about why we do what we do, and I think you all are on the same page with us now. If you thought we were, you know, off our rockers at the beginning of the session, I would hope that you're like, oh, no, this is important that this happens in school, because it is important that it happens in school. So again, evidence-based social-emotional learning programs create learning environments that are safe, caring, well-managed, and participatory, provide social-emotional competency, self-awareness, okay, important, social awareness, self-management of all those feelings. We're still so cool. um, When you have good social-emotional programs in schools, what Nicole had said earlier is that kids feel a greater attach attachment to their school. And if you ask a Kennedy kid or a Wilson kid, what middle school do you go to, they don't say a native school. They say, I'm a Wilson kid mm -hmm. or I'm a Kennedy kid, and that's important, and we like that. We don't want them fighting each other, you know, rivalries too much, but we want them to feel attached to their school because it's important for them to have that feeling because it does lead to greater um, academic interest, if you will, when those things are settled, that kind of thing. So that's what that slide was all about, if you will. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, and we're going to keep going with you. Okay. Suzanne, okay. Okay. All right, so we're um, on the one that says peer leaders, opportunities for and social and emotional growth. Okay. Um, and Basically, what the peer leadership program is, which we, we're now in our second full year of um, doing at both middle schools, and actually the first year of doing the same program at the high school this year, it's a way for us to work with the older students and take sort of some of the things we've been teaching them through the social emotional curriculum in fifth and sixth grade and have them actually learn it and understand it on a much deeper level and then apply it <coughs> to their everyday actions with their, with their classmates. Um, so it looks at the, the slide that Nicole had with sort of the five different areas that social-emotional learning addresses. Um, peer leaders help students learn um, about these five areas at a much deeper level. So for instance, self-awareness, um, it, it really forces them to think about their own behavior as an individual and then what it also means to, to them to sort of look at their behavior as a leader in their school community. Because every student who has joined peer leaders, um, it's pretty much open to anyone. If you want to join, you're in. Um, you have decided that you want to take on a leadership role in your school. And the, the primary purpose of it is to um, be an anti-bully organization, but it really goes beyond that, to um, trying to help create a community, a culture, <coughs> a community that celebrates, the, as Ro was talking about, the diversity of our students and that makes helps everyone to feel connected to other students in the school, adults in the school, and create a community that's caring and empathetic towards all of its members so that every kid feels connected in school. Um, the self-awareness piece is really, again, helping kids to think about how does my behavior feel to me, 
and how does it feel to other people when I do that? Um, and it's a, you know, one of the things we emphasize with the students is that no one is perfect. We don't expect you if you're a peer leader to be perfect. We don't expect you if you're not a peer leader to not be perfect. No kid, no adult, no person is perfect. We all make mistakes. So how do we look within ourselves if we are in, encounter a situation and decide how to act and then reflect upon it afterwards and say, were we happy with what we did? Did we, one of the things we teach the kids is sort of the difference between intent and impact. You know, you might have intended one thing by what you did, but the impact was something very different. And sort of what do you do when you encounter that situation? Um, that self-management idea, that idea of learning how to sort of stop and check yourself, this is a real skill for young teenagers to learn. As most of you know, you know, the brain is still developing, that part of the brain is still developing until they're in their early 20s. So that self-regulation, the more that they can practice the skill, the more naturally it will come to them. So that's one of the things that peer, leader provi peer leaders provides for students is opportunities to think about and practice so that something becomes second nature to them. So when they see different situations, when they have to think about different things, they don't have to think so hard because they've already been thinking about it and talking about it with their peers. Um, one of the important things that we hear about from the students in the program is that, um, you know, as you know, developmentally, middle school, it's all about my friends. What do my friends think of me? What do the kids in the class think of me? What do the kids in the hallway think of me? What do the older kids think of me? What do the younger kids think of me? It's, it's all about what does everyone else think of me? So when we talked earlier about that, um, the notion that there are many bystanders when there are situations and that kids traditionally do not speak up for fear of what other kids will think, it switches that paradigm to I'm going to speak up because I know six other people are going to speak up. And we've heard over and over again, I'm sure Ro has, I know we have here, anecdotally over and over and over again where kids say, the other day this happened in class, this kid said something, and last year nobody would have done anything about it, and this year three kids said, hey, that's not cool, don't say that. Um, so it's really, it's be, the kids I think are feeling the power of um, their knowledge that they're gaining through the peer leadership program. And I should back up and say that um, the two middle schools and the high school are using um, a curriculum that's been developed by the Anti-Defamation League. Um, and it's research-based. They've been using it for many years in um, middle schools and high schools around the country. Um, and it's become a very powerful tool for the students because they, the, um, they go through training and, and, and go through these different activities and exercises to help them learn about different aspects of how to be an upstander and how to also create um, positive school communities. And um, they also realize that, that there's a broader uh, community of students who are going through the same training and learning the same thing. So they feel connected both within their school. Um, as um, what said, let they be like. Yes, here we go. <laughs> We're just doing contingency planning. No more. Yeah. 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 That would yes. be another request for parent teaching. Yep. Parent. Excellent. Yep. It's a great idea. <coughs> There's really great stuff in, in that curriculum. Um, one of the things I, I'd like to share with you, because we also talked about relationship skills and, and responsible decision making. Um, there was something, one of our peer leaders last year, actually one of our peer trainers, which Bela is a peer trainer, and we'll talk about the different subcommittees. Peer trainers are a subcommittee of peer leaders who go through additional extensive training in order to then lead workshops with other peer leaders and younger students. So they go through three or four full days of training with the trainer from the Anti-Defamation League. And um, one of the eighth graders last year made a comment. He came to speak to our um, school council. And he said, you know, the really good thing about this program is that it's really raised my awareness. He said, so, like, when I go to lunch every day, I look at the cafeteria differently than I ever looked before. And he said, and the really bad thing about this program is when I go to the cafeteria, I look at things differently. <laughs> because he now felt this added sense of responsibility because he was more aware of things that were going on. Um, and so it, it's good and it's bad, but you know, the kids are embracing it. They, they want that responsibility. And then this year, when we were interviewing students for um, the peer trainer position, which you know, there's sort of an added level of responsibility. You have to prepare to work to lead workshops. You have to be comfortable public speaking. Um, one of the students in his interview said, um, you know, I knew somebody who was a peer trainer last year, and he was friends with my brother. And sometimes I would see them, and some of the other boys would like say things that weren't nice. And every single time, this boy spoke up and said, hey guys, that's not nice. And he said, and I know that's really hard to do amongst your friends. I know it's hard for me to do amongst my friends. He goes, but I want to be him. And like, to me, that was like, whew, that's really, that's powerful. So the kids are really providing great role models for one another. 
Um, and this is eighth grade? Seventh and eighth. Seventh and eighth. Seventh and eighth. Um, so this shows you, I'll show you two graphics. We have both the Kennedy and the um, Wilson graphics. This happens to be the Wilson one. Very similar. So we have about 150 some odd kids in the seventh and eighth grade here at Wilson and 118 at Kennedy who have all joined peer leaders this year. So we have a large number of students. Um, everyone um, is considered a peer leader. They will go through a series of trainings throughout the year on recognizing bullying and biased behaviors, standing up against bullying and biased behaviors, and sort of that whole idea of creating a sense of empathy and trying to help make um, a stronger school community. Students can also choose, if they want additional responsibility, a subcommittee. So I mentioned the peer trainers, that's what Bela is a peer trainer. We have 25 to 30 students at each school, 7th and 8th graders, who go through additional training. Um, they actually train the other peer leaders. They run a lot of the workshops for training the peer leaders. They also go into the 5th and 6th grade classes and do some um, workshops with the younger students. Um, we had, last year we had some of the 5th graders asking for autographs of the <laughs> older kids who had come into their classroom. So I mean, it's, obviously, it's, I mean, that's who you want them to be, uh, aspiring to be. Um, we also have um, a school culture and diversity subcommittee, which works to just basically have school spirit activities to celebrate the diversity in our school. Um, we have a community service subcommittee, so they work with our community service club to do um, fundraisers and activities around social justice. Um, <coughs> student assistance subcommittee, those are kids who do after school tutoring or in the morning they bring the fifth graders down to breakfast so they don't run down the hallway, they tour new kids to the school, around the school, that sort of thing. Um, and then a technology advisory team, they'll make um, PowerPoints and movies and things like that of, of peer leader activities. Very similar at Kennedy, um, they've combined their school culture, um, has both the school spirit and they also do the, um, the website and the technology. But pretty much the kids are involved in the same kind of activities. You might call them different subcommittees here, but they're doing lots of positive things. Um, around the school. So clarification. Yes. So if they're in the subcommittee, they've been the, a peer leader as well. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, so everybody's a peer leader and then if you choose to partake in additional activities, that's super. Um, what's nice about that too, for instance, is um, like the uh, community service is a club here at school. So we have fifth through eighth graders who are in that club. So when you then have seventh and eighth grade peer leaders who go to that club meeting, they're modeling for the younger ones sort of ways to think and act, um, which is, is powerful. So uh, initially the, the mission of the peer leaders was to decrease bullying and bias behaviors. Um, but it goes way beyond that. It's really about creating a positive school experience for everyone. To, um, this is actually a slide that the students, um, Bela and some of the other kids, when they did, like this year when we were recruiting new peer leaders, um, some of our returning peer leaders created the, the PowerPoint to do the assembly. They spoke in front of the <coughs> entire 7th and 8th grade, so 450 students here, you know, 300 students over at Kennedy. Um, and they, they're the ones who did the pitch to the, their current 7th and 8th grade classmates to join peer leaders. Um, so they said it's really to make a more inclusive school community, increase the number of student leaders who make our school a better place, and make everyone feel like they belong. So it's um, been a very powerful, powerful program here, and we're really um, excited now. Um, this year, this summer, the um, high school had its first group of students who underwent the ADL training in August, and now are doing workshops up at the high school. So it's, uh, it's something that will be pretty much visible 5 through 12. Um, in the years to come. So, I'd like to introduce Bela. Um, she's going to actually lead you, so you have to kind of put your uh, student <coughs> hats on, in an activity that's typical of something that might be done um, in a peer leadership meeting or done with a fifth or sixth grade classroom. Okay. <laughs> I have to give her credit. Her partner, who was supposed to come, found out at the last minute she had a cheerleading practice and couldn't come today, and I said to Bela, you can go solo or you can go home. She's like, I'm going solo. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bela Ghosh. I'm a peer trainer, as you know. I'm also the peer trainer coordinator for the um, group of 30 students yeah. this year. So um, I'm going to do an activity with you called Dominoes. So who's ever played Dominoes before? Okay, so what's, what's Dominoes like? Can you explain to us? Like, you, there's the chips, you set up the chips, and what do they do? 
Well, you, oh, the, okay, yeah, you set them all up and they have to knock each other down. Yeah, so they all like go in a line and make this whole spiral or something. So um, in this activity, you are going to be like human dominoes. <laughs> Don't worry, you're not knocking each other over or anything. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You're going to like make a human chain about connections in our community and as, yeah, as a group. So, um, in this activity, we're, you are going to have to get up, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to um, take two parts of your identity. Um, so what makes you, it can be like something you like to do, something like one of your hobbies, or something about your background, like... I am part Indian, and I also like to play field hockey. So those are two parts about me. So you say on my right hand, um, I am half Indian. And on my left hand, I like to play field hockey. And then someone from the group will come up if they are half Indian, or if they like to play field hockey, and they say, on my left hand, I am half Indian, and then they add a new identity about themselves to the group and you make this chain around the room okay. and we'll, we'll be all connected in a human <laughs> circle kind of like six degrees of separation right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly so um i will start and on my left hand i am part irish and on my right hand i play soccer <laughs> That's not fair, Well, wait a second. Does anyone play soccer or used to play soccer? Not the kid? Yes. <laughs> so let's start. Oh. On my left hand, I am hard Irish, and on my right hand, um, I'd love to do art. So on my left hand, I like to do art. On my right hand, I like to cook. All right. <laughs> okay, we're going to start on this side. So then we can start on this side. Come on up. Yeah. And so everyone should say their name, too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Nicole, and on my right hand, I played soccer a long time ago, and on my left hand, I'm a mom. <laughs> I'm Ann Blanchard, and on my left hand, I like to cook, and on my right hand, I like to swim. <laughs> my name is Patty. On my right hand, I'm a mom. On my left hand, I'm married to a Puerto Rican. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Okay, so on my left hand, left right, I have to get that straight. On my left hand, on my left side, I love to swim. And on my right side, I've lived in a couple of different countries, not in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Doreen. On my right hand, I have a Hispanic daughter. <laughs> and on my left hand, I love to read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, can I switch them up? Oh, yeah, you can. Okay, so I'm going to Do they like those? Live in different countries. Oh, live in different countries. I, uh, my name is Robert, and uh, on my left hand, I am from uh, Africa. I've also been to a number of countries, and on my right hand, I'm interested in health. I'm Fonda. On my right hand, no. I like to read, and on my left hand, I love to sing. <laughs> My name is Jim. Uh, on my left hand, I wrote a national health care proposal. On my right hand, uh, I like to play basketball. I'm Regina, and on my right hand, I like to sing, and on my left hand, 
I love to read. I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I love to read. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, my, my name's Andrew, and on my left hand, I like to play basketball with my son, and on my right hand, I like to be outdoors. Mm. <laughs> trying to help you guys out. <laughs> on my left hand, I like to be outdoors, and on my right hand, I also like to quilt. Oh. I'm Catherine, and on my right hand, I love to read. And on my left hand, um, I love to walk my dog. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, so you can choose I, another. I, I have two sons. None? <laughs> <laughs> two of how many? Just two, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. My name is Margaret, and I love dogs, and I have a dog, and I love to be outside also and do gardening. I'm Katie Janetsky, and on one side I have two boys, I actually have three boys and a girl, so <laughs> in that order. And um, on my right side, they're retired. <laughs> we all jump up for that one. You can get the room on hey, that one. Hey, hey. I, I just want to know if there's anybody else who are, who has more than like four more kids. I think there's many same people in here. <laughs> okay, how about uh, I have, um, I'm not from Massachusetts, I'm from New England, all around New England. Hi, I'm Maureen Riley. I, on my right hand, I like to garden, and on my left hand, I love chocolate. Oh. <laughs> I'm Tess Roberts. On my left hand, I like. Well, I'm not from here either. I'm from California. <laughs> On my right hand, I like to paint. Oh, that's a good one. Houses? I know. I just gonna say. <laughs> yeah, landscape. Uh, hi, I'm Dawn. On my right hand, I love chocolate. And on my left hand, I love to collect coupons. Hi, I'm Suzanne. I used to paint a lot, and I would love the idea of doing it again someday if I had free time. And on my right hand, I love to bike. <laughs> okay, so now we are going to try to connect the circle. So um, try to find things that both of you have in common with, um, what's your name? Dick. Dick? <coughs> so um, try to find two things similar between you and Dick and hey, Faith. And oh, so you can Faith. connect them. Mm -hmm. yeah, what do you like thing? to do? What do I have to do? Or do I have to do? Uh, <laughs> it could be either. Or it could be or something about you know where you're from or anything like that. Oh, I have to. Yeah. Uh, I like to travel. Okay. Does that work for you? No. No. Does that work for you? Does that work for you? Do you like travel? to travel? All right, good. We have a connection there. They like to travel. Now you got to go over to her. And now you got to find something for Faith. Yep. So something you two have in common. Like I have an autistic. Okay. So you have. Okay. I'm a physical therapist. So there you are. Yeah. So um, in our three days of training by the ADL, they also did this activity with us, the peer training group. So we were trained by the ADL um, teachers, Anti Defamation League, um, against all types of bias and stereotyping. And then we go out and train our peers in the 7th and 8th grade peer leaders and the whole school, the younger grades too. So we're trained and then we apply it to our community in the school. Um, 
towards our peers. And I think that makes it a very different like point of view being trained by people who you go to school with and that you hang out with and they're on the same level as you. So it's a different concept. But so um, for this uh, activity specifically, we have some discuss discussion questions that we're going to ask you. So did you learn something new about the people in the group as you were connecting your human chain? Yes. So what would you say you learned? In particular, something. Well, it's just interesting finding out the different interests of the different people. Yeah, like you wouldn't know looking at them that maybe someone liked to travel or. Right. Has four kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's <laughs> <laughs> always tired. <laughs> um, like, is there someone you thought you knew well that you learned something new about? Does anyone know each other? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> How about that we all have some basic connections that were, you know, yeah. who said they like their parent or that they're, what, who said that? A mom. A mom. <laughs> you did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you all have basic similarities that bring you here. Right. And there's also so many differences, but similarities in between this group. So it's a very cool web that we have right here. Um, so. What what did you learn that really stood out to you that you didn't know that people would have in common? Was there anything that really struck you? That people take time out of their busy day to you know enjoy their lives by other things other than working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean a lot of these things were hobbies, right? Yeah, like yeah. I like to garden. I would do this. Yeah, it was very cool. So. What were some common themes that you saw the participants get up for and say on their left or right hands? Reading. Reading, Reading. yeah. You know, as we said, hobbies. Right. Like sports. a lot of people said, I like and to sports. do sports. Sports, yeah. So you kind of get into that group of what are the other people doing that can give me ideas of what should I say? So it kind of sets a tone. But then there was also people who said, like, I grew up in Africa, or I lived in Africa. I like to travel. You know, I have an autistic. So, um, what were some of the characteristics that you saw shared? What was the theme? Chocolate. Everybody was chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, in our training, someone said, I like to eat food or something like that, and everyone scrambled. <laughs> okay, so. As you said, there were some characteristics that everyone kind of shared, like chocolate maybe. What were some of the characteristics that you thought maybe weren't brought up as on your hand that you want to share? Values, maybe? Mm -hmm. Core values, mm -hmm. like what you think. Okay. Religion. So, religion. Yeah, yeah all said religion. Exactly. Politics. Stay away from Not in the Bible Belt field, so religion wasn't brought up. Yeah. yeah. But do you think, I mean, I know some people in our, especially in our training, there was one boy who said he was very connected to his religion, but he didn't bring that up in on my right hand, on my left hand. Mm -hmm. So That's do you think? What? That's really interesting. Yeah. So, and if you asked him, he said, uh, are you very religious? He would say, oh, yes, and he would tell you about it, but it wasn't brought up in this situation. Do you, what do you think? Why, why do you think something wouldn't be brought up? Well, for personal reasons. Just like a lot of people didn't talk about work, because that might be more personal. Um, a lot of times you don't talk about your religion or your feelings or a lot of different things, things that are personal you're not usually willing to share in a public setting. I mean, as much as you come in here and say, I like to work outdoors, I like to play soccer. You know, these are all things that are considered kind of norms mm -hmm. and that they don't kind of reflect in a more deeper personal. Mm -hmm. I think there's a safety issue, like yeah. what yeah. you're saying. Comfortable. Comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, what do you feel will fit this situation and this mm -hmm. atmosphere? Is that what you think mostly impacted what people said? Okay, yeah. so. And do, you know, keep in mind that this is sort of a different type of group 
where some of you don't know one another, whereas the groups that Bela and the other students will be working with would be kids who at least know each other a little bit. They're either they're on the same team or in the peer leader group, and so they work to start off with things that are maybe not so risky, and then as they spend more time, then you might get into activities where people open up a little bit more, but it's always left up to individual choice how much you want to open up about something that might be personal. Um, yeah, as we were saying, um, we do have this one activity that I often like to refer to in these. It's called the diversity iceberg. And so, as you know, icebergs are 10% over the water and 90% under the water. So we talk about what you can see over the water line, like what you can tell from just looking at someone, and then what some people assume or what's under the water line that you can't know. You would have to sit down and have a real conversation or get to know this person for a while to know. And so would you say that most of these were um, things that you would have to see over the waterline or kind of just slight conversations, not getting to know you, getting really deep into who you are? Over the waterline. Yeah. Okay, so um, what do you think the purpose of this activity is? Like, why do we do this? Why do we share it in this setting and in the classroom? Maybe to show that with all the kids that are coming from different backgrounds, different households, and, and everything, and they're all coming from you know, four or five different elementary schools, too, and they're being pushed together to do, just to recognize that you know, you're not alone in this, this, and this, and you can make a connection. You might. Look at somebody who go, goes up and says, oh, I didn't know they liked to travel. I didn't know they moved around the world, you know? I mean, and you, you, you realize that you're not as disconnected as you think you are. Yeah, so you sort of, a lot of people when they come into middle school, they think of all these new kids and all these differences that I have. But as we go on with this activity, we, we recognize that there are more similarities than differences. Like, for example, I know sometimes we had someone say, um, who is it that their husband is um, Hispanic? Yeah. Yeah. And no one got up for that. But there was much more times that someone got up for it and had a similarity than we had differences, and no one got up. So, um, can I make like another um, answer to your question, too? Which is, if you, it taught me with a little bit of work, you, you can find a connection to somebody. Mm -hmm. you, you just put a little bit of thought into. Mm -hmm. Or a Puerto Rican husband, I have an Hispanic child, or yeah. you know, I like to cook, or I like to eat, you know, <laughs> you know, or, you know just a little mm -hmm. effort and you can make a connection and you can think so. Yeah. Good. So and does it also kind of ease the kid's mind, especially incoming, that, you know, you're not that different from everybody else. You have they, everybody has the same concerns, mm -hmm. fears, you know, and, and that in of itself, once you find out somebody is <coughs> feeling that same way, oh, I don't know about that, I don't know about that, just with, like with the bullying, anti-bullying, mm -hmm. well, you know, you're standing there, you don't do anything, you're, you really need to do something, and to just realize that you are connected and you're not only by yourself, and you're yeah. just better. Yeah. Must help teach empathy, then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially. I mean, we these connections create a culture of empathy that you can really empathize with your peers. Because then, if you do that, students are more willing to stand up for someone they empathize with, and for others that they feel they're connected to. And students, when they feel connected to their peers and their school and their community, I think they definitely feel better about themselves. So any other thoughts about why we do this? To make me ask, I thought it was really interesting if I may. Um, the ickiness that you felt when you started is the same thing that the kids feel. Like, do I want to go up and identify myself there? And what risk am I taking? And as adults, can you imagine as adults we were feeling that today? And then, you know, how much do I want to re reveal about myself? there's that element, but then there's also, by the end of this whole exercise, I am not that different. There are some things, or, well, I didn't know that about that person, so I thought they did a terrific job. And the poise that you have is astounding to me. <laughs>
Kennedy Middle School who are I'll give you the quick intro while yep. just finding that. We were asked, um, superintendent has taken a number of the administrators to different conferences across the nation, and we've been asked to talk about our peer leadership program and our anti-bullying efforts at these national conferences, which has been really nice. So we have always put either a Kennedy component or a Wilson component about this is out of the kids' mouths. And after you see this, I have to say, and I know Wilson had the same experience, is that I could not have said it better. So <laughs> I kind of asked a couple of prompt questions to get the kids rolling, but this is, you know, for the want of a better way of saying it, out of mouths of babes. So. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. Except it's yeah. Max. I guess what I think about when I share leadership is that I kind of think about the family that we had that we made here. Like, for example, we don't if we didn't join this, I don't know about you guys, but me, I wouldn't get to, I wouldn't know about like the seventh graders, and like since we got to teach like how to stop bullying and stuff to the younger kids, I also got to know them more. So I don't know, it was a really good program that I enjoyed doing. Yeah, since we have like an hour after school, hang out with each other, we got to know each other better. Yeah, and I mean even in the eighth grade, there are some people on the leadership team I wasn't really good friends with them, but after two years, I guess. Working side by side to make our school a better place. I've gotten close to a lot of different people. So, yeah. Have you all been in the program for two years? Yes. That's okay. So, why don't you tell us about how you think the program is different, either here or there, from the previous year? Well, what I thought was that uh, the first day I went to the meeting, I was I was kind of not really scared, but I'd say like nervous because you don't really know what's coming at you. So. But then, like, after a few meetings, like, you got to, like, learn the information and all that stuff. It actually was, like, really fun because I, myself, when I was in seventh grade, I got to know the older kids, too. Yeah, um, another thing, I think that the program has gotten a lot better this year. Last year, we had our, like, individual groups, and I don't know, it was kind of like you got really close to the six other people you were working with, but you kind of did stuff separately. But this year, it was kind of like... Yeah, we had our little groups that we worked on specific projects with, but then, you know, at the end of meetings, we'll come, we come back and share what we worked on, and, you know, you know what was going on in different groups, so it was much more a sense of, like, community and, like, a team, I guess, this year, so I think it was a lot better. I don't know how you felt last year, but I think this year it's really organized. You know, you, got, you go in your groups for a certain amount of time, and then you come back, and you have... We time it well, and we have a good amount of time to talk about things as a group. Yeah. Together with different groups. Can you talk a little bit more about what kind of things you've talked about? About what? Um, like what kind of things you've talked about? Well, we have the high schoolers come down, and that really helped us. Well, we got a lot of questions answered, and that was really helpful. Well, in my opinion, I think the program does a lot. Like, uh, for example, uh, I was on the teaching committee part, and I was able to like teach the younger kids too. And there was a time that I remember where I was uh, doing a one on one with a fifth grader, and he actually like shared a lot, and I got a lot closer. Like how he was actually he used to get bullied, but then he told me that after we came in and like taught everyone else and like how to like uh, how to stand up to the bullies. He felt like a lot more comfortable, and he like thanks us a lot. I feel like it's just the presence of a leadership team that really decreases bullying. Just the thought of, oh, there's people going to stick up for this guy. I don't know if I want to bully him. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed similar things, especially from the sixth graders. I'd say when 
to leadership, I was kind of just a shy kid, just in, like talk with kids only in my grade. But like after this, when like moving on to high school too, I think I'll feel like more comfortable talking with our like seniors or juniors or like sophomores. And then maybe like if uh, like any of them need help, like I would like maybe sometimes know what to do. But, like, when I filled out the application form, I set a goal of I wanted to speak out better and speak to people, and I definitely feel more comfortable speaking to my friends. After two years of leadership, when I do see bullying, I feel more confident and prepared to step in and do something, but I don't really see that much anymore. So, yeah. All right, so that sort of gives you highlights of the Peer Leader Program. Um, Jamie is now going to talk about um, what you can do at home to sort of... So, obviously, direct instruction and social, social emotional learning in school is vital. It really helps give these kids some building blocks on what we expect for them and also what we hope the world and society is going to expect for them once they leave the school age. So there's some things that are some helpful tips that we help foster with the kids in school that also can be translated to their home life. And interestingly enough, a lot of these tips also work with adults. So spouses, co-workers, a lot of this stuff also translates. Um, when I worked at the school for kids with autism, I went through a supervisory program, and looking at these tips are the same kind of things that they instilled in us. So this is stuff, lifelong tips that you can use. Focus on strengths. A lot of times when we need to give kids critiques or feedbacks, it's often tempting to start off with what they did wrong. A lot of kids also focus on what they did wrong. They don't see that if they got an 80% on a test, they don't see that they got 80% right. They see that they got 20% wrong, and that's what they focus on. So a sandwich effect is starting off with a positive. That's your bum. Um, in the middle, where your burger would be, that's your critique. But, um, what feedback do you want to give a kid? And then at the end is your other one, a positive. So you could say, if they're working on their math homework, I really like how you started your math homework by yourself. I'll just give you some feedback. You know, maybe you want to look over two and three again. It looks like you might have made a mistake there, but you're on a really great roll. So starting off on that positive, put the critique in the middle, and end on the positive. So the takeaway is that my parents or my teachers aren't focusing on the negative. They see what I'm doing right, they gave me feedback, and they ended on a positive note. So the sandwich effect really works great. Um, specific consequences at home. This is what we try to do at school. We try to frame to the student what happened. So I noticed that something happened. I noticed that during class you were really distracted. Um, state the consequence. Because you were really distracted, I really need you to come after school today to catch up on what you missed. And keep the consequence time bound. So in school we would say, so please stay after with me from 2 to 2.30 and we can work on it together. Um, and we'd, we'd expect that we as teachers would mean what we say. So we're going to expect that we're going to go find them and make them come back. So, Thinking about at home, a lot of kids think that when they get in trouble, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. They focus on, I'm in trouble, and I'm going to be in trouble for the rest of the night. So trying to focus on framing what they did that maybe you were disappointed by, um, stating what the consequence will be, and keeping it time bound. So if you say no television for two hours, after that two hours, make sure that that consequence goes away. If you say, I want you to go outside and rake the leaves for 20 minutes, even if they're outside for 20 minutes, just piling the leaf up and they're not really doing great raking, after 20 minutes, they did their time, they're out of it. So just making sure that you follow through and once it's over, it's over so they can see that they can get through it. It's not something they're gonna to have to focus on. Staying calm, this is gonna be a really tough one for a lot of us going through life. Things are gonna frustrate us. What we try to teach our kids is that there are coping strategies they can use. What's difficult is <coughs> kids and adults and us as humans, we can catastrophize things. Things may seem like the end of the world for us and we truly do feel that way inside what we hope is that we model for our kids in school and at home that there are other ways to cope with it besides visibly showing that you're so frustrated that you can't calm down. So teaching our kids and also doing it ourselves that we can take a break before we react. A lot of times with some of the kids that I counsel, I talk to them about the Snickers commercial where the girl asks the guy a question and he puts the Snickers in his mouth and he has to chew the Snickers before he gives an answer because he needs to think of the right thing to say that's not going to get him in trouble. A lot of times with my kids, this is what I talk about. Think about the Snickers commercial. Before, if something happens that makes you feel upset, put that fake Snickers in your mouth, or what can you do to pretend that that Snickers is going in your mouth so that you can give yourself time before you react? Because a lot of times, as Kenny was saying, intent versus impact. What we intend sometimes has an impact that we didn't want to happen. So sometimes saying that wrong thing in the heat of the moment 
takes you a week or a month to resolve versus if you just took some time before you said it or before you reacted, you might have a better outcome. Identify your triggers. So talking with your kids about things that are the hot buttons for them, that if they get pushed, they know that they fly off the handle with. So just having that open discussion with your child and taking some cool down time. It's okay if you guys get into a fight at home and at school and you just separate. It's okay to have 20 minutes to an hour or so of we need to be away from each other and come back after it. A lot of times our intent is to try to resolve it in the moment, especially with friends. They try to, they get into a fight and they try to resolve it and both parties want to resolve it, but if both parties are angry, it's not going to get resolved. So it's okay to take a break. Sometimes with kids it's okay to take a week where they just, let's stay away for a week and we'll come back. And it's okay to do that. Be willing and able to apologize. If we do things that we wish that we had it, it's okay to own it and say, I said something or I did something I wish I hadn't, and I'm sorry for it. We want kids to be able to know that they can take ownership out of the mistakes they made in their lives. A lot of times their general response is, well, he made me do it, or you did this, and I had to do this, I had no other choice. Just being able to realize that they can own up, and it's okay to own up and swallow that pride and apologize. Provide choices. We do this a lot. What's interesting is we provide choices to kids, and sometimes the two things we're providing are things that they still don't like. So you can do all the even numbers on your math homework tonight, or you can do all the odd numbers. Now, they still have to do the same amount of math problems, but for them to be able to feel like, oh, but I'm making the choice, even though it's the same amount of work, they feel a little bit more better going into it because they feel they made the choice themselves versus someone else saying, you have to do this, this, and this. So, the remember part, the choices are still in your control. It's not that you're giving up power, it's that you're letting them take ownership. And again, the two things you're choosing don't have to be do your homework or watch TV. You can do your homework from 3 to 4, or you're going to do your homework from 4 to 5. But they're choosing, so they're a little bit better going into it. And allow and guide children to solve problems on their own. A lot of times, we want to jump in and help our kids. I do the same way too. Kids will come to me and I want to jump in and say, well, this is what you should do. But that's not helping them. It's teaching them that they need to go to someone else for help instead of let's work through this together and try to find a solution on your own. The questions you can ask are, what do you think you can do in this situation? Or if you choose to do it this way, what might happen? So you're guiding them rather than just jumping in and helping with themselves. Yeah. And, and so I try to do that. But then, then they choose not to do anything. Yes. I, I, I don't know how to make that bridge without getting involved. A lot of times, I mean, through life, we're going to try to guide our kids to make the right decisions, and then they go out into the real world, and then they don't make the right decision. That's okay, as long as there's some feedback at the end, where they come back and say, all right, what did you do? Well, I did nothing. All right, well, tell me how that went. Well, <laughs> nothing happened, and now it's the same. It, it even got worse. All right, so let's come up with a plan. Tomorrow, this is what you're going to try. And it, it could take a couple times where they keep coming back, and they're saying, I'm trying it, I'm trying it. Or they come back and say, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. Eventually, they're going to see, especially if you're giving them that feedback, that by doing nothing, they're doing something, and it's actually not making things better. It could take a while, it could take a week, it could take a month. Eventually, that light bulb's going to click, but it's that feedback that they need. It's that feedback that, all right, you tried nothing again, and what happened? It got worse. All right, you tried nothing again, and what happened? Eventually, they're going to get sick of trying nothing, but knowing that you're going to hold them responsible by coming back to them and asking them how it went, will eventually let that light bulb click. Hopefully, it will let that light bulb click for them. Thank you. And I think this one was more. Oh, two more. Help kids label their emotions. A lot of kids will say things that they don't mean because they feel one way about it, um, such as, I'm really, really, really angry that, um, that my teacher gave me so much homework. Well, OK, you're angry, but it sounds like more like you're frustrated that you have homework and maybe it's difficult for you. Um, kids and adults struggle with really honing in on what emotion they're feeling. If they're feeling sad, then it's a different intervention than if they're feeling confused. If they're feeling confused, then we know that we can help them. Well, how can you do your math a little better? Let's help you work through that versus if they're feeling sad about something else. They have trouble really labeling what they're feeling. So being able to help them label those emotions are important. Encourage sharing and helping together. Um, a lot of things in middle school is getting out of that egocentric mind. In elementary school, there's a lot of focus on me, 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 me. And in middle school, we're really trying to push them that you belong to a larger society than just you. You belong to Wilson. You belong to Natick. You belong to the world. So doing things that help them see that, such as volunteering in a food shelter, doing a walkathon, collecting donations, just to show that they're part of a bigger macrocosm.
And the last thing I have, this is something that we do a lot in counseling groups as well as in um, the second steps curriculum is we watch movies and television together. And we might pause the movie or the TV show and say, this just happened. What, what is this person doing or why did he do that? What happened when he did that? The interesting thing about movies and television is it automatically <coughs> engages the kid versus if you said, all right, if you go to school tomorrow and do this, how is your friend going to feel? That can be hard for them because there's a lot of gray area. They have to visualize it, and sometimes they're not going to visualize it the right way. Seeing it on television, they're already engaged. They see what happened. They see the reaction. You can pause it and go back to it and say, they did this. What happened? What do you think would have happened if they did this instead? And it helps if it's a movie or television they're already engaged with. So if it's a TV show, most TV shows these days have conflict almost every yeah. single day. So yeah. if there's a TV show you know your kid's really engaged with, using this kind of format will help them see it because they can already connect with the characters. And if you try to do it at school, you did this to Billy, what might he say? That's going to be a lot more difficult for them. Do you feel that because they actually have a visual, yes. that it really makes it connect? Absolutely. You're supplying the visual. So you're taking out that demand of having to make them do all that mental exercising. Right. You're just showing it to them and asking them questions and the guided questions. So these are things that we do at school that doing them at home, just like we hope the kids do math homework to make them better in math, doing some of these things at home will further solidify their social emotional learning. Yeah. Just really quickly, do you also believe that um, late kind of mentally labeling the kids' currencies? I have four so they're all different. And I, every kid has currency. What I mean by currency is one kid, you take away something technology-based, that's going to affect him. Mm -hmm. The other one could care less, so you have to take away sports. You know, So do you feel that that is a, 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 a helpful way to kind of gauge I do, and I would try to get away from the word take away and try to move towards the word earning. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we think of taking away, we're starting off that you had it and now it's gone versus you didn't have it and now let's work towards you getting it. So taking away from that, we always did this um, with the school that I worked at as we, we start off with this is what you can have as long as you do this, this, and this versus all right, you did this and now they don't see the direct exchange. They don't see I did this without so any sports is gone but it is helpful to see I did this, this, and this, and I earned to do this activity. So really focus on, I mean, I, I know I don't do enough, so to really focus on that positive part. And really like, focus on the positive, yeah. And I like how you said the positive critique, then the, then the critique, and then the positive. Yeah, it really helps them see that work effort, that yeah. if I do this, this, and this, oh wow, this is what happens when I put in the work, and that can also be related to school, when I do my homework and I study, wow, I got an A, versus I did, and, and I, if they don't study and they don't get an A, what are they, what's their excuse going to be? They're not going to say, oh, it's because I didn't study. They're going to say, oh, my teacher's rude, my teacher's mean. So really seeing that you need this, this, and this, and you're going to get this versus I'm going to take this away if you don't do it. And one simple little change of language can also help with that. And we call it, um, instead of saying but, you say and. Because think about it. If someone says to you, oh, I really liked your presentation today, but. Mm -hmm. Like, all you're going to hear is what comes after the but, right? right, right. Where you say, I really liked your presentation today, and it would have been helpful if you had done X, Y, and Z. You know what I mean? So then they can hear the positive a little bit more and not forget the negative.